Hi, my name is Corey and I'm going to be your uh, YouTube biology tutor. So I just wanted to introduce myself to you guys. A um, couple of things about myself. I am busy studying my BSc um, in Complementary Health Sciences at the University of the Western Cape here in Cape Town. Um, I love being outdoors, love hiking and the ocean and everything to do with nature. And I also like sports, I love being competitive and that. Um, so, how this is going to work is once or twice a week, depending on the amount of work that we have to cover for the week, I'm going to be making a video to help you better understand the work and also to highlight the concepts that are going to be asked uh, of you in exams and tests. So, I want to try and explain the work to you a little bit differently than it's in the textbook, but also remember to pre-read before you watch this video because I'm not going to read the work to you straight out of the book. You have to read the work, go through it, familiarize with it before watching the video. Okay, so let's start with today's lesson. So today's lesson is about chapter one in your textbook. It's about the classification of organisms. Um, if you haven't gone through the work in your textbook, pause the video, quickly read through it, go through it, make sure that you know what's going on and then continue watching. So to start off, uh, first we have to take a look at living organisms and the characteristics of these living organisms. So there are seven characteristics that are very important that you have to know and these characteristics is what constitutes a living organism. If a living organism if an organism, not a living, if an organism does not meet all these criteria, it's not considered to be alive. So the characteristics are movement, respiration, sensitivity, growth, reproduction, excretion, and nutrition. So a nice little way to kind of remember these seven characteristics is to link them to each other. So you have to remember it less. So what I've done is I've linked movement to sensitivity. My thought process behind that is that sensitivity, the definition of sensitivity says that sensitivity is the ability to detect and respond to changes in the environment. So say you're sitting on the couch and you start to feel hungry. That is a stimulus, hunger. You're able to respond to that stimulus. So what do you do? You get up and you go to the fridge to get food. What is that? That's movement and that's our next characteristic. That I've, that's the one I've linked it to. Movement is a change in position or place. So you have a concept of being sensitive towards a stimulus, which is your hunger, and you get up and you respond to that stimulus, you go to the fridge, get food, and like, oh. The other two that I've linked is growth and nutrition. Because, well, I mean, come on, that's simple. You eat and you grow. So that's pretty, pretty easy to remember. But make sure that you know these definitions of these characteristics, and uh, you can also link respiration and excretion and why I link these two is because respiration is the chemical reaction in cells that break down nutrient molecules and release energy. Now these breakdown products need to be excreted. So that's an easy way to remember them is to actually link these ideas and sort of compact the amount of things that you have to know. Okay, so next you have to know the cell and I suggest that you draw the cell and label it. That's one of the best ways to know the cell. Um, there's some common features of the cell and these are the common features I've drawn here so, but make your own drawing because that's going to be the best way to actually learn it. Common features are your cell membrane, your cytoplasm, your DNA in the nucleus, uh, your ribosomes and enzymes which help uh, with reactions and things. So then we're going to move on to the actual like the classification. So before we go into it, I just want to give you a background on um, DNA because DNA becomes very important as it is used to classify organisms. So if you don't know, DNA is the chemical making up our chromosomes and it's passed on from generation to generation. Um, DNA is made up of base uh, pairs and it's found in the nucleus. So what I've drawn is there's our cell we've got our nucleus and we've got our genetic material is we've got these bases that are linked to each other at an adenosine 
uh, cytosine, guanine and thymine. But just be aware that um, guanine links to cytosine and adenine to thymine. C to G and A to T. So how do you classify things in the biological or the scientific biology world? It is according to the binomial system. That's how they, that's a, um, it's an international system that all scientists use um, for classification. It's basically a complex classification scheme and they use Latin names, Latin words to name the organisms. So there's a simple mnemonic that you can use to remember the binomial system which consists of your kingdom, your phylum, your class, your order, your family, your genus and your species. So the mnemonic that I use, if you know another one, if you be feel free to use it, says King Philip cried out for goodness sake. For goodness sake! Familiarize yourself with that system because you go, are going to use it and be aware that your genus and species name is the name, is the scientific name of each organism. And there's a very specific way that they write this name. It's in Latin, so most of the time it doesn't make any sense to us. But for example, a wolf scientific name is Canis lupus. Canis would be our genus name and lupus would be our species name. But notice that they are underlined and that's very important because if you write a scientific name, you have to underline it. In a textbook, it will, be, it will always be italicized. But since we can't write in italics, we just we underline it. Another important note is that the first name, the genus name is always capitalized, where the species name is always in a lowercase. So those are your two rules. Underline and capitalize genus and lowercase species. Those are three rules. Well, two rules, one. Anyway, you get it. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the kingdoms of organisms. So there's five kingdoms. Your kingdom Animalia, kingdom Plantea, kingdom fun Fungi, kingdom Pro Protoctista, Protoctista, and then kingdom Prokaryotes. I would suggest you go study these kingdoms. And what I've done is next to each kingdom, I've written down the characteristics. This is important, you have to know this. And I suggest you make a summary, something similar, or be creative, do your own thing, but know these characteristics because you're going to have to be able to identify uh, if animals come from a certain kingdom based on these characteristics. So for example, the question might go as follows. Organism is multicellular, cellular. it has a nucleus but, and it feeds on organic substances. What kingdom is it from? So then you have to be able to know that it's from kingdom and amalia. We also take a look at viruses. And viruses are interesting because they're not considered to be alive. They have the ability to hijack other cells' machinery and use that to replicate themselves. Um, the reason being that viruses can't, aren't alive is that they don't meet the seven criteria of a living organism. The seven characteristics we did on the first page. Viruses can't move on their own, they can't feed on their own, they can't multiply on their own and they can't, they don't show sensitivity um, Yeah, and they can't reproduce on their own either. So what they do is the virus will invade another cell, I've got a drawing here, virus invades the cell, hijacks the cell's machinery to reproduce itself, clones of itself. The virus will, the cell will literally burst open because there's too many viruses occupying the cell and then those individual viruses will go and attack another other cells. Now we're going to look at the classi classifying animals. So we're going to be looking at different phylums um, and there's also five phylums that we're going to be taking a look at here. Um, and these phylums are arthropods, annelids, mollusks, nematodes and vertebrates. So you have to familiarize and go and learn each of these individual phylums but in depth, you have to know vertebrates, the classes. So, vertebrates, are cons the classes consist of fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. These are sub-classes, sub-folders almost. Think, think of them as sub-folders. The classes are sub-folders of the phylum. That's just an easy way to remember it. So, fish, you have to know characteristics. Amphibians, characteristics, reptiles and so on and so forth. 
The reason for this is, again, you're gonna be get questions where you get asked the characteristics of different classes and you're gonna be able, have to be able to recognize and know which class they're from. So go and do the same summary, sort of, uh, with the phylum arthropods, because um, that's also gonna come up in tests and exams. Then this, we just quickly touch on classifying plants, the kingdom plantea. Um, so they, in the textbook we take a look at the ferns and the flowering plants. Um, just go through the work, summarize it neatly for yourself. Um, it doesn't seem to be a major bulk of work. Okay, and then lastly, keys. Keys are very important because scientists use keys to help identify and classify animals that maybe they found a new type of bug and they are trying to classify or trying to see if, it, if another similar one has been found. So it's almost like a flow diagram, but it's, it's used to help name and identify. So follow, do the examples in the book, familiarize, familiarize yourself with them and make sure that you are able to follow um, one of these keys and figure out what animal it is. Okay, so at the end of every class, we are quickly going to go and do some, I've got some questions from past papers that I want to sort of show you how the work is going to be asked to you and so that you can sort of know what uh, section of the work to put your most attention, give your most attention and emphasize that work. So, first question is, why does the energy needed by a human increase during the first 10 years of life? So this question asks you or requires of you to know the seven characteristics of a living organism. So the answer here is growth because obviously your body is growing. So the energy is needed to sustain that growth. Okay, so next question asks which features do animal cells share with plant cells? So this question requires you to know the common features of all cells, which is just a section beneath the seven characteristics of living organisms. Draw your cell and go and take a look at what uh, features are there on all cells. So we know all cells have a nucleus, they've got a cytoplasm, they've got ribosomes, they've got enzymes and they've got cell membranes. So that you might get a question such as this, where there's a box and there's chloroplast, cytoplasm and nucleus. So within this, now you have to be able to know if a chloroplast is present in all cells. Pay attention to this, all cells. Plant cells, animal cells, all cells. So we know chloroplast is not a feature of all cells. It's only found, it's found in plant cells. So we can look at these two as our op options. And we know nucleus and cytoplasm is found in all cells. So we, that will be our correct answer C. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at another question. It asks what, which structure of a cell is not present? So again, your drawing of your cell is critical because it's going to help you visualize the answer. Label it and you'll quickly be able to figure out if, what the answer is if you um, know that drawing. Okay, so another question asks, us to take a look at a diagram, it shows a plant that has been placed near a sunlit window for a few weeks. Which two characteristics of living organisms have affected the shape of the plant? Now this is almost sort of my drawings very bad, but this is what it looks like. The plant's been growing and then it was placed by the sun and it grew towards the light source. So we know that one of the characteristics is growth because the plant's grow. And then another characteristic will be sensitivity. The light source is a stimulus on the plant and the plant has the, has the ability to react to that stimulus. It's sensitized toward, to the sim stimulus. And this stimulus can be anything. I mean, for example, fly trap plant. There's a stimulus, the fly, and the plant is sensitized to that stimulus and then it reacts to that stimulus. So another question asks us, what is the characteristics of amphibians but not of reptiles? So this is where that comparison is very important. You have to know exactly all the characteristics.
Okay, so I hope you guys really enjoyed this lesson. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next lesson, which will probably be next week. If you guys have any questions or comments, please pop them into the comments down below and I will happily answer them. Um, in the meantime, good luck with the studies and go and get those good marks.